what if you want to get your young uh, child or, or your grandchild interested in astronomy, exploring the night sky, but you can't even spend $100? Um, maybe that budget's less than uh, $80 or $70. So what can you do? Now, one of the things, the essential tool for a lot of beginner amateur astronomers and also for experienced amateur astronomers is to have a pair of binoculars. Binoculars are great uh, because they're low power, wide field, they produce bright images, they can sh reveal nebula and they can reveal galaxies. Um, but uh, if you're hand holding binoculars, about the highest magnification you want to hand hold is maybe if you got real steady hands, maybe about 12 power, these are 10 by 50 binoculars, so uh, eyepieces that, re that result in 10 magnification with 50 millimeter objectives. And this produces a pretty bright uh, image, uh, five millimeter exit pupil, uh, which is uh, great for deep sky observing, uh, good for looking at comets and a number of things. So it is a very useful tool, but you do have to hand hold binoculars unless you buy um, you know some sort of uh, tripod platform for it um, parallelogram platform are also sold for binoculars and nice to use uh, but uh, you know if you're if you're a grandparent or if you're a parent and you're on a limited budget uh, you have to carefully choose the kind of product that might keep your young child interested in astronomy and keep them exploring. As for myself, my personal telescope when I was young, at 10 years old, I had a 40 millimeter refractor. It was on a very wobbly mount, um, but that telescope gave me uh, views of the moon that still stick with me today. And I still have a, a um, not, not the original uh, telescope that I had when I was a kid, because I pretty much had destroyed it by taking it apart, but I did find, I found it again, and I purchased that telescope again, uh, because there's so many great memories about that telescope. And if I had not had a small telescope, an inexpensive telescope, and at the time when I was uh, 10 getting this, uh, I think my parents spent, could only afford $15 for this gift, and that was a burden for them at the time. But if I had not had that small telescope, uh, even with wobbly tripod, even with poor optics, um, you know, really what most amateur astronomers would call a trash telescope, I wouldn't have gotten into the hobby the way that I have. I wouldn't, probably wouldn't own this telescope company, Explore Scientific. So I'm grateful for that small telescope. And um, so, and I know that many, many of my friends are uh, involved in astronomy because they had that first spark with a small telescope. And so, let's look more closely at what small, small telescopes can be and what might be what we would consider to be a poor quality telescope today versus something that's decent that sells for about the same price. You know, you can get good quality uh, if you choose wisely. So let's talk about the heart of any telescope. And the heart of any telescope, of course, is the, um, the optics themselves, the objective lens that is gathering the light uh, to bring that light to focus. And um, telescopes that were developed during the time of Galileo used a technique of just using a single lens. Um, and this, in fact, is very much like uh, Galileo's telescope. I'm going to take this uh, lens hood off. And we're going to disassemble it so you can actually see how this uh, telescope is uh, made. Because the objective lenses during Galileo's time were not of very good quality, the way that they made the image sharper was by putting a field stop right behind the lens. And um, uh, this one has, um, in fact, a 50 millimeter lens here, but it's got a stop down ring right behind it that takes it down to 32 millimeters. So uh, one of the uh, misleading parts of this telescope is that it is in fact a 32 millimeter uh, refractor instead of a 50 millimeter refractor. And um, 
So it's a 600 millimeter focal length. Stopping it down doesn't change the focal length, but it does change the F ratio. This is almost a, uh, like around an F18 telescope right now, and it's advertised as an F12. It's advertised as a 50 millimeter objective, 600 millimeter focal length telescope. Um, and uh, so that is uh, a little bit misleading uh, uh, regarding a telescope such as this. The other thing to look at is the accessories that come with the telescope. In this case, we have a 0.965 inch uh, Hygens eyepiece, a 0.965 inch diagonal mirror, and um, you know a, a 0.965 inch size focuser. The finder itself just uses a single lens up here. This is a uh, behind here is uh, literally like a peephole. Um, uh, with a single lens, and so this is made like a Galilean telescope. Uh, uh, but uh, if you look closely at the bracket that holds this, there's no real adjustments to um, to align this little telescope, the finder scope, with the main telescope. And so pointing it is going to be pretty difficult to do. Um, Hygen's eyepieces are not known for uh, a lot of eye comfort. Um, they will produce a sharp image, of course, and uh, this particular one is uh, uh, like a 20 millimeter eyepiece, and so it's going to produce about 30 magnifications. 600 millimeter focal length divided by 20 is going to give you 30 magnification. Uh, but the apparent field of such an eyepiece is around 30 degrees apparent field, so it's going to look like looking down a, you know, a thin pipe into the sky. The next thing to look at is the mount itself. And uh, this is uh, what's called an alt azimuth mount. Uh, this particular mount does have a handle for adjusting it, which makes it easier to hold uh, the telescope and to point it. Um, so azimuth is this side to side movement and altitude or alt is this up and down movement, kind of like tilt and pan on a telescope. But you can see even when I'm just adjusting it here, it is uh, not very sturdy. And part of the reason is, is that in order to reduce costs, they have chosen to use plastic for the mount parts here. And so that, uh, that does reduce the uh, pointing ability and makes it a little bit more frustrating to use uh, when you have something like that. The other problem I'm seeing here too is that if you're pointing the telescope and you, are, uh, you have the handle over one of the uh, leg supports here, you can't point it very high. You do have to clear that and then you can point it up at the sky. So now we're going to take a look at the tripod legs. This is the supporting structure uh, to the mount and um, in small department store telescopes typically what you're going to see are very thin legs um, because they can't use a lot of material uh, typically to uh, uh, you know, because it raises the cost of the instrument. But if you're looking for something that's under 60 bucks, this is typically what you're going to see. Um, that is not very stable. Um, the uh, parts being plastic, thin wall aluminum, um, make so that the, the mount is, uh, does have a lot of flexure. Uh, it does have a lot of vibration. Frankly, these are the kind of things that drive amateur astronomers nuts. Uh, once we uh, have gone through an inexpensive telescope and we go to our better telescopes, we really enjoy the stability of them, uh, the light gathering ability of them, the better eyepieces, the better everything. And so we always feel that it's better to spend, you know, better to save up a few hundred dollars and buy something better. But what if you can't save up a few hundred dollars? Let's say that you want to get your child interested in astronomy at a young age and you got to spend 60 bucks or less. Um, well, there are options and you just have to be uh, careful when you shop and you need to ask the right questions about the telescope that you want to buy. So here we are again with uh, another 50 millimeter telescope and we'll just take off the lens hood like we did before and you can see this is a clear aperture uh, 50 millimeter objective lens. But I'm going to take it apart here so you can see how this is constructed because it's an airspace doublet and you want a doublet lens 
uh, because you can get better uh, image correction and you're, and you're not relying on a field stop which limits the aperture to correct out uh, the distortion on the edges. So let's talk about the objective lenses on both of these telescopes. You can see that uh, we've got this uh, field stop behind uh, a single a single lens okay and this is very much how this is how Galileo did it except the hole that he had was much smaller uh, on his lenses he had I think maybe his first telescope was like a 26 millimeter objective lens but the field stop behind there took it down to maybe around maybe like around a centimeter or something because he was trying to get rid of aberrations towards the edges uh, when you take a magnifying glass, just a single magnifying glass, um, and you shine light through it, sunlight, you'll see that the rays of light will actually split up into different colors. And that's what's called chromatic aberration. Um, and, uh, and it's because the center of this lens is actually thicker than the edges of the lens. But that's how the light gets bent through the lens because it's thicker in the center, thinner at the edges, it bends down to a focus. And that's how you get an objective lens to focus on a telescope. This lens, actually it's two lenses. One is the uh, lens that's doing the job of gathering the light and bringing it down to a focus. It is thicker in the center, thinner towards the edges. But then we use this lens right here and it's actually flat on this side and concave here. So this convex lens fits right into that concave hollow and what it does is it evens out the edges here now the thicknesses are the same from the edge to the center to the edge and we get rid of a lot of the chromatic aberration that's where the light separates into different colors but there's also this thing and it's it's a um, it's a spacer between the lenses and so that gives air spacing between the two lens elements and allows this uh, this double system called a doublet, and it's an airspace doublet, it gives it a better color correction than it might have otherwise. So um, full aperture, 50 millimeters, this is going to gather 244% more light than this system. And light gathering is what it's all about because the more light you gather, the further into space you can see, the more detail you can see in nebula, uh, the more detail you can see in a galaxy or faint stars. And so with a 50 millimeter objective versus using a 32 millimeter objective, uh, you can see a broad range of celestial objects. When I compare these two telescopes side by side, uh, what I notice is, is that uh, the tube assembly, the actual tube assembly of the uh, telescope on the right is made out of plastic. And because it's made out of plastic, you can see if there's a uh, light kind of reflecting off the sides. Uh, it is black plastic, but light reflecting off the sides reduces contrast. And you can see the other unit as, as I sweep across here. This is a metal tube that's painted flat black on the inside. And this is going to keep stray light down and make uh, images of uh, like the moon, for example, very contrasty. It makes for a darker sky and that helps deep sky objects pop out a little bit better. So when you see the Orion Nebula through this instrument, it's actually going to look better. Not only is more light going to get into this instrument because of the larger objective, uh, uh, the stars will be pinpointed to the edges. Um, they will, uh, it will have a nice contrasty look to it which always helps when you're doing observing. We've talked a lot about the objective lenses and the differences between uh, a singlet lens with a field stop behind it and that, those disadvantages, although that was really the first way that uh, telescopes, refractor, refracting telescopes were improved. Uh, having the doublet airspace system really does make a much better system. And later, if uh, someone actually really gets a deep interest in astronomy, they can move up to something called an ED apochromatic refractor. And those can be two element, three element, and four element systems. Um, but uh, I think that the, uh, the other side of the telescope, which is the IP side, is super important. You can take a really mediocre telescope and just by putting much better eyepieces on it, you can get a much better, much more comfortable view. These are two eyepieces here. This is a uh, 25 millimeter, what's called a 
Plossel Design, because a guy named Plossel designed it way back when. And this is a Hygens eyepiece, one of the first eyepieces ever designed. Um, uh, the diameter of this eyepiece is a 0.965 inch standard. This is a 1.25 inch standard. This is what's used on premium telescopes a lot of times. Uh, this eyepiece all by itself can sell for about $40 to $50. So uh, a great advantage in this particular telescope uh, that is selling for under 60 bucks. And it comes with two of these Plossel eyepieces. One is a 25, which is gonna give nice low powers for deep sky observing. Low power viewing actually lets you see further away because you get a brighter image to your eye. But bright objects like the moon, planets, those kinds of things that where you'd like to use some magnification, uh, we have a 9.7 millimeter eyepiece. So Plossal eyepieces have wider apparent field, which makes it look like you're looking not down a thin tube, but through a wider port. And it also gives you more eye comfort. Your eye is not squeezed all the way up to the lenses uh, to, uh, to get that field of view. You can get, be further back, more comfortable, and eye comfort is what it's all about. Eye comfort is, also makes it a lot easier for a young person who's using their telescope for the first time to get a nice, good view through a telescope. Now let's take a careful look at the finder scopes on both of these telescopes. Uh, here we have uh, the uh, small um, aperture uh, uh, optical finder. This telescope finder has no adjustments up and down or side to side. So in order to get the parallax, the, the parallax is the adjustment uh, so that this tube is seeing the same thing that this tube is seeing. And so in order to do that, we just physically have to move it and twist it and bend it until we get something that looks pretty close so that when I look through the finder here and I point the telescope, I will see the object of my target in the center here in the center of the eyepiece. And what we have here is something called a red dot finder. The red dot finder uh, actually illuminates a projection of a red dot against a clear lens. And you can keep both eyes open, and what you'll see behind the uh, finder scope itself are the, is the background stars. It makes it infinitely easier to point uh, because you're not peering through a small uh, lens. Also, you'll see on the side there is adjustments, so we can adjust the side-to-side -side position of this red dot, and there's also another adjustment down here in the back. Excuse me, I was thinking it was in the front, but this will adjust the up and down motion, so we can get this aligned with our, with our eyepiece very, very quickly, very easily, and this allows us to uh, point the telescope very easily. You'll also notice, too, that the finder has a little peephole here so that we can initially side it to start the calibration work here. And what it ends up being is just a much easier, much better uh, way to find stars in the sky. And finally, we're taking a good look at the tripod here. This is an all-metal tripod, and it has this accessory tray that can hold the eyepieces. Because it is a tubular, a solid tube, this is a stronger tripod than the aluminum channel type. And we get up to the mount itself, and we can see that we have the same kind of alt-as adjustment, but now, instead of plastic, this is metal, and so we have much less vibration with the telescope, and we have much better range of movement with the uh, longer uh, handle adjustment. To lock it in position, all we gotta do is give it a twist, and it stays. And so it's just overall a better, stiffer, smoother, less vibration type of system out there. Uh, again, for about the same price. So all these nice features, the inch and a quarter eyepieces, the red dot finder, the metal tube with the flat black paint inside, the metal tripod uh, mount, the alt azimuth uh, metal head there, much stiffer, much less vibration. Uh, the airspace doublet lens in this National Geographic 50 millimeter refractor really do make it a fantastic value. Um, you'll find that uh, uh, National Geographic typically uh, only allows their brand to be put on better product. And I don't think that uh, I'd want to sell anything less quality than something like this because 
you know, we really do want to spark the interest of youngsters out there. We do want to give great value for uh, what uh, uh, parents and grandparents can get for uh, their kids. And, um, you know, so for all of that, you're getting an amazing deal. Uh, but I do have to be honest, even the, uh, the other telescopes that I've been showing are better than Galileo's own telescopes. But we've come a long way and it's time to uh, step up the quality. And so where are you gonna find this kind of product? You're gonna find it in department stores. You're gonna find it online. Uh, and um, so, you know, we hope this dispels the, uh, some of the uh, misnomers about department store telescopes.